like a number of videos I've produced, this is based on a blog I wrote on my website. That article goes into far more detail on specific armour designs and covers many more types than I talk about here. So if you're interested in this subject, I suggest you check it out. You can also find the relevant citations to sources there. I'll link in the description. The infantry soldier of the First World War initially went into action with no personal protection at all. For headgear, they were issued only with caps, kepi, or at best a leather helmet like the famous pickle halber. The thinking behind this was that modern rifles were far too powerful to be deflected by a steel breastplate capable of being worn by a soldier as part of his equipment. But this reasoning did not take into account the effect that artillery, and more specifically its ability to produce fragments and shrapnel, would have upon the battlefield. By 1915, the casualties caused by shrapnel, particularly to the head, were all too apparent. French General Auguste Louis Adrian, who I'm going to have to do a video on sometime, developed the helmet that bore his name, the Adrian, and an immediate reduction in casualties and in fatalities was noted. Britain and Germany both adopted the helmet in short order to protect the heads of their soldiers. Both designs, the British Brody and the German Stahlhelm, were essentially modern versions of medieval helmets. With the acknowledgement that low velocity projectiles were a threat to the head of soldiers, came a realisation that perhaps armours could be fabricated that similarly protected abdomens and limbs. Most nations would field a host of different designs, some improvisations, some products of actual development programmes, and they would often be used in numbers that were surprisingly large. The British developed multiple designs in two different armour philosophies, yielding, made from silk or fibre and designed to absorb the projectile, and rigid, designed to deflect them. The Chemico body shield was an example of yielding armour. Weighing six pounds, it was composed of layers of silk, cotton, linen and tissue, then hardened with resin. It was only used in limited numbers. For a rigid design, the Dayfield body shield was one of the more widespread official armours used by the British, with 20,000 issued. Made of manganese steel, it was used by troops on high-risk duties such as wire cutting and sentry, but was heavy at 18 pounds and cumbersome. An early appreciator of the need for better protection for troops with the introduction of his helmet design, General Adrian also recognised the need for body armour. Early in the war, he concluded that wounds to two areas of the bodies resulted in fatalities, the head and the gut. As a result, he set about developing a simple lightweight plate armour that protected the lower abdomen. The Adrian abdominal plate weighed two pounds and could be combined with groin, thigh and chest plate protectors. Although 100,000 were made, they proved unpopular with the troops and don't seem to have seen a lot of service. Although the French tried multiple different designs, none seemed to have been very successful. One measure that was were armour epaulettes, simple steel upper shoulder protectors that slipped into a standard uniform tunic and were made from the offcuts from helmet manufacture. Though only adding some additional protection from above to airburst artillery, they did find favour at the front and were made in hundreds of thousands. Additionally, the French recognised that their Adrian helmet was not perfect and made a host of experimental models trying to perfect the design. They also spent considerable effort on developing visored helmets in an effort to protect the eyes of their soldiers. Though late to the war, the US Army was as interested in body protection as any other belligerent. On their entry, the Americans adopted the British Brody helmet, which they would also go on to make 2,700,000 of before the end of the war. But they also had a rather remarkable expert to assist in their own development program, Bashford Dean, a curator at the Metropolitan Museum. With the huge casualties occurring in the war, Dean applied his intellect to the matter and compiled a huge amount of data on casualty figures. Combining this with his knowledge of medieval armour, he developed a range of helmet designs and body armours. The model number two was modelled by Dean on helmets from the ancient world and, he claimed, provided the best possible protection for the soldier. However, the design had some problems transitioning into production. Although Ford would eventually produce a couple of thousand in late 1918, this was too late. Designed to integrate the better protection of the number two with the ease of manufacture of the Brody, the number five was considered better than the British helmet in that it provided greater protection to the side and back of the wearer's head. However, it was considered to be too similar to the German standard helmet. Dean would also make numerous prototype body armours, 
culminating in this design, seen with his number 5 helmet. The design featured arm protectors and was designed to allow the wearer to use a rifle unimpeded. Dean was not the only American inventor labouring on body armour. Dr. Brewster of New Jersey invented this panoply that proved proof against a Lewis light machine gun at close range. We know this because Brewster insisted on wearing the armour whilst being shot with a Lewis gun. Fitted with a spring cushioning system, the impact was apparently extremely light. However, at 40 pounds, the arm was judged not to be effective and declined. The Germans, with typical thoroughness, recognised from the beginning that there would be tasks that soldiers had to undertake that required more durable helmets than the standard. Though they did experiment with specialist designs, like other nations, they also built the ability into their standard helmet from the start to accept an add-on plate. Normally issued to snipers, machine gunners and sentries, the add-on armour plate for the standard German Stahlhelm was around 6mm thick and weighed between 5 and 7 pounds. It overbalanced the helmet and was not particularly popular. The Germans also issued towards the end of the war a dedicated bulletproof mask for their snipers. Worn without a helmet, it weighed 17 pounds, was 6mm thick and could apparently resist a standard rifle bullet. Whereas the Allies fielded body armours in comparatively limited numbers, the Germans ordered large numbers of body armour. The famous Sappenpanzer. An estimated 500,000 were issued. Widely used, the Sappenpanzer armour protected the front of the soldier effectively, but was heavy at between 20 and 24 pounds. As such, it was intended for use by troops in static positions, such as sentries and machine gunners. Although hundreds of thousands of sets of body armour were produced, it gives an indication of the sheer scale of the First World War that it's never really impacted on our consciousness of the war, leading to the impression that body armour was barely used. The limitations of the available materials, technology and far more pressing needs for war production meant that body armour never really had the chance to make a larger impact on the conflict, an intriguing and arguably tragic possibility. To quote Michael Vlahos, Keeping fragments out of a soldier's torso meant survival, pure and simple. France lost 1.75 million dead out of a total of 39 million. Would not losing a half a million or more men less not have been welcomed to wives, mothers and children? Thus the issue of whether body armour could have been issued and used more effectively in the First World War remains one of history's most interesting and possibly most tragic what-ifs. That wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you are interested in military history and affairs, feel free to check out my website, militarymatters.online. I'll put a link in the description. Also, have a look at some of the other videos I've produced. You may find something else of interest. Check out some of the links coming up.